So those of you that don't know Hunter, we're the St. Louis company that doesn't make beer, uh, but we do make undercar surface equipment here in the US uh, that we ship it globally. But in order to do that, we work with 400 global suppliers and it's about 10,000 SKU numbers. Uh, and you can kind of see over there, it's about 15 uh, countries that supply that product. I wanted to throw this in there before I actually get started is I found this slide because uh, I'm obviously learning about data and how it works within supply chain. Only 23% of companies actually collect and fully utilize their data. So that means seven out of nine companies are, are still transforming and don't know their data or the opportunity the data has. So what I'm going to do is what I'm going to walk through is kind of what we've done through the years. So kind of pandemic, during pandemic, and kind of post-pandemic. So pre-pandemic, we were mostly focused on the cost. You know, the cost of the product, all, you know, the business associated with it. So what was all that cost, right? Lead time, quality, payment terms, freight costs, and delivery performance. So we, uh, we built in-house tools. Uh, and this kind of, it, this has changed some platform, but this is still the, ma the main platform. On the top, it's just generic attributes on hand, on order, forecast, standard cost, commodity levels, what, what, what factories are using it. We have four factories in Mississippi. The, the midsection here is actually our daily inventory levels. So this would be at today's point. And then the sawtooth, you know, back through here, this is all history. Uh, and then this is the future uh, that is planned in the schedule based on uh, forecast, based on customer orders coming in, based on factory usages. And the idea is actually this slide right here is it looks like a perfect sawtooth. Uh, this is safety stock level here. Uh, Hunter is a company that is just in, just in case, not a just in time company. So we kind of would like to keep some predetermined safety stock levels based on the cost of the part, size of the part, you know, on 10,000 different parts. Here, this is the quote section. You know, multiple vendors are, are quoting for, for this business. Down below is all open orders and past orders. <clears throat> so again, pre-pandemic, we were mostly focused on the, the cost and, and costs associated. So. Before we started building our, these tools, we would have this to the buyer and they would go with the $46 price and they just move on. But as you guys know, there's, there's a cost, right? Quality, delivery, the buyers have to deal with expedites, they have to deal with quality, quality can shut down a factory. So one of our first things we did is we tied our program system, our purchasing system into our quality system and put a formula to it in real time. So basically what this is doing here is it's retrieving data from the quality system, ranking that supplier based on their last 90 days and their last year of their quality performance. And it's add and adder. So we'll call them vendor A, B, C. Vendor A, you can see, I think it's about 5%, the $2 adder. So they're getting about a 5% adder based on their quality performance for the last 90 days and in the last year. And also, that the red arrow, is they can quickly pull up that data, right, and understand why is that top supplier have that 5%, or why is that mid supplier only, only had the 2% cost adder. So they can come in, they can zero in, this is the vendor, they can look at all the parts supplied, look at the, you know, maybe it's a certain part that sticks out, and then that certain part, they can quickly come down and understand what was the issue, you know, and why is that supplier having those quality issues. Then, uh, obviously, we had to add delivery to it because this is, this is the buyer's heartache, right, it, it is the delivery. So in this, it's, it's a pretty simple tool. Remember the sawtooth, you know, safety stock EOQs, is it really just grades, looks at all 10,000 SKUs on a daily basis, looks at that vendor, grades it, are they keeping us in the levels, min-max levels we want to be in. It allows them a little bit 10% adder. Uh, but that's basically is how it's doing the calculations. 
So you can also see Bender A has the highest cost adder. As well, we can come in and we can look at the vendor's performance on all parts, you know, as that vendor. Or then, you know, maybe it's a vendor that's at 95% and our goal is to get them to 97%. Uh, so maybe we come, you know, come down and we can look at all parts that they're supplying. You know, they're down, they're, these parts down here, they're at 100%. But these parts here, they're not. I mean, here are actually some are 13, 39. So maybe it's not the vendor. Maybe the issue is that part. Maybe that part does not fit that vendor. Maybe their capabilities doesn't have it. It's maybe their capacity issues. Maybe it's outside processes and they just don't work with outside vendors, third tier, second tier vendors, or second tier, third tender. All right. Lead times. We also look at lead times. You know, this is pretty much what everybody has seen on the news for the last you know, three years about supply chains and lead times. This cost adder here is, it, it's, I'll be honest, it's level set. And what I mean by level set is it's, it's comparing apples to apples. Uh, and the reason why I say apples to apples is what it does is it takes the lowest lead time vendor and then it adds a metric based on each, each lead time, whether it's two weeks, four weeks. And when I say apples to apples is if there was a China shipment here, right, a China vendor, of course the cost would be very enticing, but it could have a 26-week lead time versus an eight-week lead time. So that's adding that cost header. If there was three overseas vendors here, it's going to be level and set and, you know, those lead times because it's going to take 24, the next guy's 26, the next guy's 30. Discount terms is another uh, formula that we decided to put into it. Um, basically, is, is Hunter is a net terms, you know, 1%, 10, we look for discount terms. Uh, and we believe it actually helps build partnerships with the vendors. You know, if a vendor is going to be expediting a part, especially today's times, you know, and he's got two customers calling, one customer pays in 10 days, the next customer pays in 100 days, probably which one's is going to get the, you know, move to the front. Uh, but at the same time, for Hunter, uh, especially <laughs> today's market, I think anybody would take a 18% annual return uh, today. So again, this was all kind of uh, pre-pandemic. Um, this was all built in. This is providing informing buyers every day on the 10,000 SKUs based on the real-time data coming from other platforms. And what this would show now is it's telling this buyer they should probably go at vendor B because they are outperforming the vendor A with the lower cost. With the same data, we report out monthly uh, to the suppliers. And this is the exact same formula is what we're using here. So this guy here who's got the overall rating, that is his total cost of ownership rating that's driving those, those cost metrics in that, in that purchasing program. So as, as expected, for the last several years, pre-pandemic, we were almost getting ourselves set up for what was about to hit supply chain, was we were growing our business with suppliers that were performing, and we were reducing our business with suppliers that were not. And you can actually see on this one here, they're still overall, this is over about an 18 month period, they're still yellow, quality still underperforming, but their delivery was actually turning green. Well, their delivery was turning green because we were moving parts away from them, right? So we were giving them a capacity. So this is, this is those, those metrics uh, with this model that, that we built in uh, to our purchasing program. Uh, so over, over those years, this is our quality graphs. It, you know, it's at an all-time low. And then this is our MIR graph. So MIRs are called manufacturing interruptions. It's an internal program that we use, that we track, a potential or an actual manufacturing interruption. It, stop, it stop the, stops the line. So again, this is that same time period. 
Well, let me go back. This actually stops at 2008. And the reason why I have a seven-year gap is because literally for seven years, we, we held that whole time low. You know, 10, 10 or so less interruptions, which is equivalent to about 0.1% of our SKUs. And when I say that's potential interruptions, so it's not even say those 10 actually interrupted. It was just, you know, we're getting low. That MIR was open. Buyer's informing. It's communicating with the factories. You know, maybe, maybe they don't run overtime that week. Maybe they shift some guys until they get those parts in the following week. So for that seven years, we held here. Well, I don't know if you guys look at this, but this right here is shelter in place, right? So no one drove cars. Hunter sales, you know, with service equipment, right? We change its equipment, changes tires, aligns cars. Uh, so there's a little bit of doom and gloom there, but then I would say shelter in place and then in about six weeks and it just off to the races. What's interesting note here is another data point is this blue. This blue, so we can set reasons of why there's you know, this many manufacturing interruption. That blue is forecast too low, right? Sales came out so fast, we couldn't keep up. Like it was just, but what was nice about that is that we were sharing that data point back with sales and marketing. You know, we've got to get the forecast accurate. So finally, you can see, I don't know, it's about, looks to be about end of 2020, uh, the forecast, too low in my R's kind of stop. But what doesn't stop is just vendor late in my R's, which is the red. But even at the point, it was only 0.3% of all of our SKUs. It could have been potential or, um, ones or twosies that, that affected line, line stoppage for a couple days. I have no idea what Ford's numbers are or, I mean, you know, whoever, right? You know, you, you hear the 45,000 F-150s, you know, sitting on lots waiting for parts. You know, all it takes, of course, is that one part. It could be a bolt, it could be a screw. It's, it's stopping. Obviously, the semiconductor is the, is the most popular one you hear. So this actually is a slide that I had presented uh, a few years ago. This is the shelter in place. So again, right, this is, this is all past history. This is our safety stock levels. We literally, is, this was a supplier in Ohio. And <laughs> how, naive we were, how naive we were to think that COVID didn't cross a state line or a county line, right? Um, so Ohio was, you know, was one of the first ones that was going shelter in place. So we quickly threw in a, threw in a program. It, it triggered all the Ohio suppliers to ship, 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 and get the product out. So that's why you see the spike in inventory, spike in inventory. But then COVID got us all. We went shelter in place. Things slow down. We don't get our next delivery till uh, what's that? June, July. But at the same time, sales were slowing, right? That's that pre, you know, we were lowering forecasts, lowering safety stock levels, but then we just go right back up, you know, when, that, when we're just trying to keep up with demand that just went off the charts. So then, kind of during that, we, we made some improvements. We had online portals, um, but we really didn't need it to be the information was flowing back and forth so fast. So we needed better external data, right? We had good internal data, but we weren't getting good first tier external data. So we came back into the supplier portals. We made it faster, streamlined it, simpler. We made, you know, copy functions, you know, what they needed to be focused on. And we're actually still working on this to, to continue. Cause I mean, again, those 400 suppliers, they're all over, right? You know, rather than, not only they're all over the globe, the person that's operating this, it could be a shipping manager, it could be a president of a company. Um, and another great feature we added was um, transit times, right? And because those were changing by the, by the week, they felt like, you know, I mean, it was, I think at China at one point, we hit an all-time high of like 110 days uh, to get a container uh, from China.
So then when, it's actually, we kind of released this right, I don't even, a few months actually before the pandemic, it, it was a control tower and it was pulling in all inter internal data and connecting it to all the external data. Um, this one actually, I, I just ran this the other day, uh, some fault predictions here. I know it, it, it's a very busy screen. Uh, there's different, uh, people call it different things at, at work, but this one here is actually the electronic spire. Uh, again, there's probably a semiconductor on here somewhere. Uh, but what's amazing about this, this is like I said, I just ran this the other day, and there's fault predictions going on here, is these yellows indicate, you know, it's a little, little machine learning, but not machine learning, that these parts were issues in the last 12 months. So it's triggering her that, you know, that you've had issues, probably some future issues. This one here has a cute, uh, current MIR, a manufacturing interruption open on it. But what's amazing about this the most is this is her weeks on hand, and then this is, it's building a critical ranking. And the reason why it's doing this, and you guys really, you, I can't see this, but this one right here, that's 60 weeks. We got 60 weeks on hand currently, but it has an 84 week lead time. And we want it 9 6 of 2023 is our next release date. But the supplier today is saying that they're going to ship it. February 2024. So even though we have literally 60 weeks of inventory, the buyer's already, it's already triggering the buyer that, you know, this could be a potential issue. What's also amazing, you know, again, like you guys see in the news and semiconductors and electronics, this part, I didn't, I didn't have the number up here, but I think there's about 2,000 part numbers that this buyer's responsible for. This is the number on her turns for the last, year, last two years, she's been kind of protecting herself. We have a 1.2 turn on our electronic components. Uh, this critical ranking used to be two, three pages long. Uh, so she's probably actually enjoying this now, uh, even though there's some fires. At least she has some time now to, to put some of these fires out. So that's kind of where we were pre-pandemic, kind of how we made it through the, the, the pandemic. Uh, Hunters, sales group, leaps and bounds. Uh, we are, so we did have about 1,000 suppliers during that total cost of ownership program. We got down to about 400 suppliers, but those are 400 suppliers that we wanted to grow business with. Now we're kind of reached that bottom point. Hunter's growing. We need to grow with current base suppliers, but we are also looking at some more strategic suppliers Obviously, there's some ge geopolitical challenges we watch, uh, whether it's in China or, or Europe. Um, so small suppliers, right? We're, we're, we're struggling with some small suppliers. We had one go out of business earlier this year. There's one right now that is, is, is some struggling. But for digital-wise, I'd say our probably biggest still digital that we want to work on is this one right here, is the more visibility through the portal downstream second tier, third tier suppliers. We, we have it at the first tier. We're, we're, we're still losing it kind of at that second tier, third tier, you know, where they're getting their materials and getting their supplies. And of course, where everyone should be working on is smart manufacturing, right? Uh, Labor is getting tough. How can we do more with less?